Welcome back, everyone, to theCUBE's coverage here for Media Day in New York City. Entrepreneurs, investors, AI innovators are all coming in. We're talking, breaking down all the action. A lot of interesting conversations around how to prepare for this next technology wave. Of course, it's theCUBE's East Coast location at the NY New York Stock Exchange. I'm John Furrier, your host. Our next guest is John here, co-founder and CEO of Ops Level. John, great to have you on theCUBE. Good to know that you're backed by Vertex Ventures, a good fan of theCUBE, and I'll say we're friends of them. Love those guys, Insuk Ray and team. Mm -hmm. Megan, it's been phenomenal. Megan Reynolds over there in New York, runs those meetups, so uh, great to have you on. Great to be here, thanks for inviting me. So one of the things that we love about the New York location for theCUBE as we start opening up the conversations is the tech startup scene here has been quite awesome. And, and you got now, I'd say a decade of all the big companies moving here, and then just the generations of the web scale startups or have moved on and they've gone to other ventures, young talent coming in, just a good vibe of just entrepreneurial activity. A lot of technical talent, you got money, you got customers, you just walk two blocks and you got three customers. You don't have to drive anywhere. Yeah, it's a great place, yeah. Um, give us a taste of the New York scene for the folks uh, who know the Cube from Silicon Valley. Of course, we've been here since the Hadoop days, but, um, but never a physical location, but I'm impressed with the tech scene here. Give us a taste of what the vibe's like and what you're seeing. It's really great, yeah, it's a, it's a great scene. We, um, we are a fully distributed company, so we're actually based like throughout um, US and even Canada, but we have uh, you know, a number of people here and um, a lot of co customers here as well. And so we, um, you know, it's both big companies, small, and like uh, smaller companies like us that are n nimble and quick moving. So we, uh, yeah, we. It's we pretty just, vibrant though. It's definitely vibrant. There's yeah, meetups going place. on. It feels like the old Silicon Valley days in Palo Alto, but it's a city. For sure. It's kind of fun. All right, yeah. let's get into the company. So you're a co-founder. Uh, what's the story? Give us a quick, let's set context. What, when, were you, when were you founded? What was the premise? What was the origination? And what's the problem that you're solving? Sure. Yeah, I'll, t I'll start with the problem that we're solving just to, to set the stage there. But it has to do with complexity, with like how modern software is being built. The complexity of large architectures where software developers have to work in these distributed systems, these microservice-based systems that are all communicating with each other. And there's just a lot to know. But there's also a lot of complexity with even like the role of a software developer nowadays as uh, you know, more and more responsibilities have shifted to them, uh, yeah. operational responsibilities and security responsibility have all shifted left. So, um, yeah, I'll tell you a little bit about how we started, though, yeah. to solve this problem. Yeah. Um, so I worked at Amazon a long, long time ago. Yeah. Uh, even then, though, back in like 2006, 2010, that time frame, they had a very large, extremely large distributed system in terms of how they ran their in internal architecture, like on the retail side, even before AWS. And they had moved a lot of responsibilities to developers, um, you know, having to go on call for their own systems and, you know, um, build it and maintain it themselves. And so um, there's a lot of tooling that they had to build to be able to support that. And uh, one of the tools that they created was something to help manage all call schedules. Um, that kind of uh, turned into, in a way, uh, PagerDuty, the company PagerDuty, mm -hmm. that spun out, and um, I was the first employee there at PagerDuty, and we were helping with that shift of you build it, you own it, you operate it, yeah. you know, go on call for your own systems. But um, we were seeing, even with our customers at PagerDuty, yeah. They were struggling with this broader concept of ownership. Like, what does it mean to own systems? And so, you know, what, and, and usually, like, how do I keep my systems healthy? You know, yeah. how do I make them uh, reliable, secure? How do I balance that against all of the, um, uh, you know, building new features faster, right? And all the all the yeah. uh, illities, all of the you know availability and, re and reliability yeah. and all that against uh, moving faster. And so uh, we were seeing that struggle. And me and my co-founder, we decided to uh, found Ops Level to help solve that problem. So I, what it when, does? What year? What, what year is that? That was around uh, 2019. Got it. Okay. So yeah, uh, five or six years ago, right. and now so about we'll five. Um, but what it does, it helps you create that map of everything yeah. that exists. And sometimes it could be like all these hundreds or even yeah. thousands of different microservices all communicating with each mm -hmm. other. Um, how how they're supported? So who owns them? Uh, the, how they relate to all your tooling, your observability tooling, your, um, y you know, where they live in yeah. Kubernetes and your infrastructure. Uh, how, you know, how, how do you support, like how do you actually support all of these things? And then um, lastly, we help you set standards for all of this. So, you know, the, you, you might be able to actually measure your production readiness standards around reliability, security, mm -hmm. uh, quality, and actually improve those over time. What's the use case? Because I mean, I can see the complexity. Of, well, let me back up. Where's the complexity coming from? Is it just growth or in sprawl of the of the platform? Because, you know, when PagerDuty started and you were first employed, by the way, that's good. That's a nice call there, and definitely a nice nice company. We love that company, PagerDuty. We covered them from the beginning. Um, that was first 
wave of the cloud. Okay, so I'm standing up some systems. Now you have the cloud native platforms are growing. Is the complexity just an evolution or is it coming from more uh, adoption? Where's the complexity coming from that you guys see now? The complexity is, is in two facets. One of them is around architectural complexity. So, uh, you know, it comes from things like the shift towards microservices, uh, shift to, to, you know, things like Kubernetes to help support that easier and faster. It just means you build more microservices, you build them faster. And, uh, and so, like, you have all these moving pieces calling APIs yeah. with each other, and that just adds a lot more complexity. Um, so it, it gets to the point where no one person can possibly understand the it's whole system. It's hard to system. own the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, no, nobody knows how it all works, you know. Um, and, and that's yeah. one part of the complexity, yeah. but the other part of the complexity yeah. is there's this uh, role complexity. So a software developer, if you go back you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, they had to really focus just on solving problems with code. You mean their role as a human? Yeah, not, like okay, yeah, yeah. Their, their role as a, as a, as coder. a, a coder, yeah. at, a, at, a, <laughs> at a, like a, a developer at a large um, engineering organization who was really more focused on, on solving the problems with code. But now we've shifted a lot more um, responsibilities to them around having to know a lot more about how to ship the code to production, how to operate it yeah. when it's there, how to make sure that the kind of uh, software that you're building, the systems that you're building are reliable and have the right kind of reliability and availability concerns met and then even secure at this point. But it's really hard to be good at all of these things. Yeah, yeah. And so that's where... DevOps um, has gotten a lot more aperture to its, its roles as platform engineering starts to become big. What's the um, view of, I like this map idea. So take me through, I'm a developer. I, I'm saying, boss, I can't build my metering system, my usage-based pricing, I can't do that. I, I got so much stuff, I can't, I'll be coding infrastructure all day long. Or is it more of, uh, there's not there's gaps in the system. What problems do you see emerging that you guys are solving? So uh, yeah, two, two big problems. One of them is like when you're building some new features, some new capabilities into your product, mm -hmm. Um, there might be a lot of uh, existing services and systems out there that have already been built that's, that's, that can help you. So like you might be able to call APIs from that other teams, uh, you know, services that, that exist that other teams own uh, and be able to do a lot of that work. So there's um, uh, just understanding, okay, what, what systems might be able to, what should I call to get you know, customer information and where do I call to get like order information and correlate them? Uh, what are the APIs in these systems? Um, if I need to make any kind of changes to those other systems in order to build that feature, how do I do that? Who do I talk to? All that. So just answering questions that they might have about like the complexity of their architecture is, is step number one. But the other step is we help those central teams like platform engineering teams, uh, site reliability teams, um, actually see how well um, th these general concerns around reliability or security are being met across the, the broader engineering organization. So if you have like, you know, all these dozens of engineering teams building software differently, uh, and they're working fairly autonomously, are they all kind of meeting the same kinds of standards? Yeah. So that's where we... Yeah, you guys yeah. are building a, like a foundational health layer into infrastructure and using everything you can do to get that visibility, sounds like. Yes, yeah. So what is, what's the, uh, take us through some, some customer deployments and customer use cases. How are they using you guys? How do you guys engage? What's the process? Sure, yeah, um, so uh, w one example, it just starts with installing us, first of all, across all of your uh, integrations. So install, it, like, you know, add, add our Kubernetes integration, ins uh, add integrations into your Git libraries. We try to integrate into everything so we can pull it all together and create that map. So yeah, code, um, infrastructure, uh, even like AWS or, or Azure integrate us there. I integrate us in your observability tools, your deployment stack, um, and we'll tie it all together. So we, we, we figure out what looks like services in all these different places. You know, even in PagerDuty, in, integrate us into PagerDuty, yeah. we'll pull in incidents, yeah. and we'll tie it all together and we'll see like what looks like services, we'll, we'll correlate yeah. these things, we'll create that map for you. And we'll even infer things like ownership. It's like, hey, these people are working on these yeah. systems, we think they're the owners. So we're helping create that to start, that, that map to start. And so, uh, like one example of, um, one of our customers, um, at Hootsuite, they're, they've been a customer for a long time now, and they're using even earlier yeah. uh, stages of our, our, our uh, catalog engine, which does this discovery. But they came in to us thinking that they had 250 services around that, and you know they, they used a lot of our discovery mechanisms, and they found, oh, they actually have 700 services. That's a much <laughs> larger uh, scope. Some shadow services out there. Yeah, it's a like... lot of them. And so you know, we, we can help them with that first stage of, di of discovery. Yeah. Um, but then, yeah, we have like other customers, uh, like um, Duolingo, that, that set up regular campaigns campaigns, every, every quarter they have these CTO level initiatives yeah. that they're running to, to migrate um, to, to either different infrastructure, mm -hmm. uh, do these package migrations, do roll up new tooling, security tooling, and they'll run those you know, through ops level. How many customers do you have? Uh, we, we have... Um, you know, yeah. 
in the in the hundreds. Uh, so you have good customer base. Yeah, yeah, and and they range from um, you know these kinds of companies that I mentioned yeah. to to larger enterprise uh, uh, companies as well. What's the difference on the large enterprise side versus these growing kind of entrepreneurial ventures or maybe smaller companies? Uh, what's the difference in terms of? They uh, just have the, the bigger, problem even bigger more. Problems? <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, the complexity is just so much higher in, yeah. in these larger organizations. So they have the problem. It's uh, but they have even more constraints around how they approach the problem, and they need to make sure that they have more, um, uh, you know, uh, guardrails. I yeah. guess you could say in terms of how these. How so these when you when they uh, deploy you guys to get to get this map, get this kind of like visibility into everything. Do you guys have services that go along with that, or is there an engagement on that side? Do you guys have a little bit of a service layer there, people? A, l a little bit. You don't really need it, um, yeah. but we can. We do offer it sometimes when, when people do need it. So but, that's uh, pretty much self-service on the customer it, it, side. Yeah, we, we, well, we, do, the, we do this self if you this, will. this onboarding period where we make sure that we can help you create that map quickly and easy, get it integrated everywhere, but then after that, it does a lot of the work to create that map. Got it. And then we can help provide a lot of guidance for how to roll out a standards program. So you're program. consultative, but you give them the keys to the car and yeah. say, you're and running, call us, we're here to help. Exactly. And let, it go, let us get it yeah. Is there auto discovery involved? Sounds like you identified some other services there with, the, with that one example. What's the ongoing monitoring and how does that update yeah. into the catalog and how does that all work? Yeah, so it, 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 when you roll out, we do a lot of auto discovery to create that catalog, create, you know, create that big map, but you have to also keep it up to date, right? Otherwise it just goes stale and all this information becomes useless over time. So it, likewise, it, that's how it works. It'll continuously be noticing new signals be coming in, maybe um, you know, new deployments from different places, and it'll, it'll try to tie all those signals to existing services in, in your catalog. And it's a foundational layer for, for the rest of it. So you can yeah. set your standards because like, if you don't know about everything out yeah. there, if new yeah. things are being built and they're not being tracked, you can't really actually set standards well it, across the board. It's, you're in a great market. I, the question I have on the uh, customer side again is, is who's driving it on their side? Head of platform engineering, head of devs, Risk management. <laughs> yeah. Well, you had it exactly. I mean, I can see three people caring about this. Yeah. Usually, we work very closely with the head of platform engineering. Yeah. They'll be the ones who will roll out this kind of tooling to the rest of the Engorg, um, and they'll also be often the ones who are brokering those standards. You know, the, yeah. they'll work with other teams like security teams and SRE teams, but they'll often be. So the they ones. get productivity and they get stability, mm -hmm. and they can go to their risk managers. Look, our number one concern is making sure things are reliable. Yeah. Different versions aren't going to break something. So it's a, it's more of a system architecture level set. Setting those guardrails, but also making it so that all your developers can move faster within those guardrails anyway. So another big part of our product, I didn't really touch upon this yet, is, is enabling self-service tooling yeah. for developers so that they can uh, take actions autonomously, they can build new services without having to uh, wait, you know, cut tickets against Your tool and they teams. bring their own tool into the table? Uh, so they use our tool, but it's, yeah. it's usually as that front door and it can reach out into other places to help coordinate. So they're integrating um, your tooling into their yeah, system? Into, okay. into the automations that they've built, but making it easier for the developers to access those automations. What's your vision as you look at the future? And first of all, where are you in your stage of funding and, and employee count? We're a post-series A uh, company. We're around 40 people. How many? For, 40 people. Oh, yeah. That's good, small company, small opportunities. We've been watching hot startups, always looking for, you know, hold on to that rocket ship. Okay, so what's the vision? As you look at the markets as unfolding, you got a nice product, I love this view, making sure things reliable. That's, I mean, we're hearing on theCUBE from people that are trying to get Gen AI go faster is that we've got to clean up the platform, get everything stable. That yeah. seems to be table stakes right now, but not everyone's there. What's next? What's the vision? Well, even like what you'd mentioned around Gen AI, there's, what we're seeing is uh, just, it's making it easier than ever to build code and build a lot of code. Um, so, you know, generate a lot of code to help solve problems, but what it's doing is it's also adding to that complexity. Um, and it's not necessarily high quality, you know, code without a lot yeah. of that oversight. So, um, you know, what, what we're seeing is that, uh, yeah. and what, where we think it's going to be going in the future is that, like, the, the pace at which these architectures are going to get bigger and more complex yeah. because of the, the, you know, the creation of a lot of these yeah. uh, code from these Copilot tools is just going to accelerate um, the, the issue yeah. that you need some degree of uh, reining in and of, of understanding the chaos out there. Yeah, I love, I always love um, the investments that Vertex does because um, Insuk um, and team, they're infrastructure guys, they love infrastructure. Um, obviously they have the Facebook pedigree uh, in that partnership, so that's key, you know Amazon, so, and Megan does a great startup uh, ecosystem, New York City meetup, mm. Megan Reynolds is awesome. Yeah, and um, we work Shout with out the... to those guys. But, you know, that being said, you guys are in growth mode, Give a plug for the company. What are you guys looking to hire? Who are you looking to hire? What openings do you have? 
you know, why should someone want to work with you guys, both customer and potential hire? Um, yeah, any, anything on both the engineering side as well as the go-to-market side, um, we're, we're, we're looking to grow our, our, our engineering team. So, yeah, if you, if you know any great engineers out there, we're, we're hiring. <laughs> what kind of engineers the, you want? People who solve hard problems, high IQ, uh, divas? All of the above, uh, please. No, well, except the diva part. Uh, no, uh, but, like, we, we hire, yeah. like, people who Eric are... Eric Smith said, hire the divas. They're hard, but they'll move the needle. I'm like, I'm not sure the divas coming in, you know? Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. No, we're good without the divas. But, like, the uh, we just want people who are, are, um, can, are smart, can move fast, yeah. can work full stack and just solve problems yeah. and, and you know think scrappy and what are some of the hard problems that people can cut their teeth in because infrastructure is hot right now I'm a huge infrastructure believer that this has got to get done quickly but not but be really uh, uh, flexible to take care of the growth so what are the hard problems that you see that engineers can get their get their hands around what are the big technical things that someone would say, I want to come in and solve that problem. Well, there's, there's two things. I mean, like what we do um, at the end of the day, the first step is, is creating like sense of that complexity. And so what we have to do is there's a lot of heuristics, a lot of AI, um, and, and even like we, we've had, like when you're thinking about how do you figure out what all these things are, um, it's not easy to do. So we've brought in and we've built uh, gen AI type tools that can help like explore your code base, um, almost as if you're a developer um, you know, having to figure out what this service does by reading the code, we, have, we can use yeah. you know, AI systems and agentic systems to be able to explore them yeah. uh, you know, independently. And so we've had to build that. Um, and so it's, it, there's so getting engineers, problems. algorithms, a lot of comp sci involved, a lot of knowledge of infrastructure. Yeah, and all of the above. <laughs> and, and so like our customers too, like they're yeah. working in big, large, complex architectures. So yeah. understanding them and having yeah. empathy for that yeah. is, is really important. Too. I mean, it's a systems world we're living in now. I yeah. mean, it's, uh, everything has consequences. Well, John, thanks for coming on the Cube. Really appreciate it. Congratulations on your startup. Thanks for coming on. Thanks. thanks all for right, this me. is the Cube East. We are in our access mode here on the East Coast, building a community set of content here as well as linking Silicon Valley and Wall Street together. I'm John Furrier, host of the Cube. More content after this short break.